My name is Heidi Waterhouse, and I'm giving a talk called Cassandra at the Keyboard, Whistleblowing at All Levels. And I proposed this talk because I realized that I keep doing the same thing at job after job, and that is detecting a problem and trying to get somebody to care about it. Why are you not? OK, we're going to have a moment where I figure out why that's not working, because it should be. It was a minute ago. I don't think so. It was working a minute ago, so I think I'm just not focused right. There we go. OK, I added a hashtag, so if you are live tweeting about it, you can say, say it, and uh, hopefully we can collate those all together and figure out what's going on. And this is my Twitter handle if you are looking to uh, find a whole bunch of stuff completely unrelated to whistleblowing but having to do with my children and my sewing. If you are here for this talk, <laughs> I'm really sorry. That's not this talk. It's an interesting topic, uh, but not really my area of expertise. So, um, you know, my apologies. Uh, hmm? <laughs> so, but if you sneak out, I won't feel I won't feel wounded. So, why did I pick Cassandra? This is a picture of Cassandra. Do do do. She is foretelling the downfall of Troy. She is correct. This is exactly what's going to happen. Here is Cassandra. She is getting killed. She is getting killed for being right. There are lots of stories about how Cassandra was getting along in life, but um, they all boil down to she was a prophet, she was entirely accurate, and people killed her for it. And I would like you to not end up getting killed because you're whistleblowers. Uh, that's really not my goal. But I want to say that there are always risks to what you're doing. So I couldn't find a picture of two docker whales colliding with each other. <laughs> and I'm not sufficiently artistic to make it. So you're just going to have to use your imagination that there are <laughs> whales under these ships. Um, so at my last position, uh, I was working for a multi-cloud manager, and we were going to add Docker support. And it was going to be super cool. I was really excited about this. I'm like, yes, we just like fire up an instance and distribute it across your whole cloud, like not just one aspect of it. It was really going to be great. So I went and talked to one of the two developers, Sergey. And I said, hey, Sergey, tell me how this works for us. Tell me how we're going to handle this. Like, explain it all to me. Sergey explains it all to me. I'm like, OK. I write it all down. Do, 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 do. And, and then I sent it to the Docker project group. And Ivan, these are not their real names, I'm just, they are Russian, but uh, Ivan says to me, that's not at all how it works. You got that totally wrong, and you need to fix it. I'm like, wow, okay, I'm sorry, that happens sometimes, like I misunderstand what's going on, or I like project too much of my own belief about how software should work and how software does work. Um, so I'm like, oh, okay, I'll go back and fix it. I fix it. I send it back to the Docker group. Sergey flips out. I am wrong, and I have changed all the things that had been right, and what am I doing? And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a second. I, I can't be that wrong twice. Like, that's just not how it's working. So I went to my boss, and I said, I think there's a systems problem. I think these two developers in two different countries are not making the same product. And she said to me, I pay you to be a leader. I pay you to do the documentation. You figure it out. And I'm like, this is not a documentation problem. This is a systems problem. We need to pay attention. And um, it was a black mark against me that I was not handling this in the way that she really wanted me to. And by the way, I'm a freelancer now. Um, <laughs> On a, on a slightly related note. Um, but it was this like massive problem that I saw because I was a technical writer and had access to all of the data and because I'm trained to be analytical. I'm trained to look at systems. I'm trained to see how everything works together. So whistleblowing. If you have a very small risk to others, the risk to you for reporting is very small. There is a proportional increase. The riskier it is for other people, the riskier it is for you to report it. And I'm going to go through and illustrate that with some examples, but I think it's really important to understand that there is not an equivalency of risk across all the things that you report. 
So if you have ever been on a car trip with a sibling, <laughs> you have experienced this phenomena. Your, your sibling has invaded your airspace, and this is not to be born. So you invoke the power of others. What whistleblowing is doing is invoking the power of others. It's sort of like summoning a demon. Like, you're like, I mystically encant this, and somebody is going to show up and fix this, and they have more power than I do. But that's always an inequitable relationship. When you are siblings, this is not a big deal. Your parent turns around and says, both of you, keep your hands to yourselves, or I swear we will pull over at the next rest stop, and you have to sit on the grass for 20 minutes. At roughly the same level is the, if you see something, say something. I used to be more skeptical of this, of turning an entire population into a surveillance mechanism, until it actually worked. It actually worked in Spokane. Somebody spotted an abandoned backpack and called it in, and it turned out that it was actually a bomb that had been set to go off on a parade route. So, like, okay, I guess there is very low risk to report and very low risk to respond and high reward. So maybe that's, that's a relatively benign incidence of whistleblowing. The next level up is if you're an internal employee. So imagine like you know of an instance of fraud or harassment or malfeasance or something is going on in your company that you know about that you think somebody else needs to know about. You, you need to rat somebody out. This is a little more problematic because it's people you have to live with every day. Like this is what you need to do to, to be a worker in this company. There is no cute animal slide to be a mandated reporter. A mandated reporter is someone who is legally obligated to report if they suspect abuse of children or vulnerable adults. And I am a sex educator for my church, and as such, I'm a mandated reporter. And I had an incident this spring where I found out a child was in an inappropriate, illegal relationship with, a, with an adult. And I had to report it. But there wasn't any question about that. Like, I didn't have any moral issue with it, I didn't have a choice because if I didn't report it and it was a real thing, I was legally liable. It's like, it's, it's a hidden stick. You know, we think of this as a, a really like affirmative thing, like you're a mandated reporter, you don't have to think about it. The reason you don't have to think about it is because there are huge penalties on the back end for not doing this. I'm gonna go back a slide because I forgot an example. I was an internal employee, I was a technical writer, and my boss asked me to plagiarize the American Medical Association for hundreds of pages. Also the ADA, the, the American Dental Association. And I was like, no, they have fierce attack lawyers and I'm scared of them. <laughs> I'm like, I am more scared of the, the AMA's lawyers than I am of losing my job. Like, because I, as a writer, am, am legally liable for that. And so I said, I'm not going to do it. And when he pushed me, I went to the CFO and I said, I, I can't, I can't do this, this is illegal, this is dangerous for the company, I can't do this. And the CFO put me on the phone with a super expensive lawyer from New York and I had a whole bunch of meetings about what was going on and I didn't get fired and my boss didn't get fired but I don't think it did his uh, job status any good. So another level up, this is Michael Rogers. Those of you from Oregon may know who this is. Uh, he is, was the IT manager for the state of Oregon. He managed all of the capital systems, like email and had a couple hundred employees. He's, he's a pretty big deal. So he gets an email one morning and it says, I want you to delete a bunch of email from Governor Kitzhaber's email account. I want it gone like it's never been. And he's like, that's really hinky, because all of that is under like Oregon's, you can't delete that because it's a, doc, a, a government document. And he's like, I don't feel okay about that. I'm gonna go talk to somebody. And he goes to talk to somebody and, and they're like, yeah, no, you're gonna, you're gonna delete that. The chief of staff said, no, you're gonna delete that. And he's like, I really don't feel okay about that. And so he goes back to his office 
and he's going to send copies to the chief of staff so the chief of staff can sort out what needs deleting. And he also copies them all onto some, some USB sticks. And the next morning he comes in and the emails are gone. And then the Oregon Press starts sniffing around Kitzhaber and his fiance, who was doing some seriously shady, hinky stuff. And they don't have the emails that would corroborate what's going on, but Michael Rogers does. And what's he going to do? He ended up anonymously leaking them to the Willamette Weekly. Um, and then the, the whole story broke, and the governor resigned. And new governor came in. But he is still, last time I read this story, not on house arrest, but he's on paid leave and has a monitoring anklet that says he can't leave his home during work hours because he's on paid leave. So that's really unnerving. That's a, a high level state official kind of whistleblowing. Like he's 56 years old. He doesn't know what's going to happen next. He said, I've asked myself if I would do it again a hundred times and I'd do the same thing again. That is, that is an easy way for us to admire whistleblowers. That is morally courageous by almost anybody's standards. This is a picture of a pacemaker. A black hat hacker named Barnaby Jack uh, demonstrated effectively that he could kill you with your own pacemaker without even knowing the serial number. Remotely, not touching you. Standing within like 25 feet of you. He could kill you with your own pacemaker and also your own insulin pump. He can just dump a lethal dose of, of insulin into you and you would go into a coma and die. And he didn't do this because he's a bad person. He did it because he had a pacemaker himself and was interested in how vulnerable these medical devices are because medical device manufacturers never really thought about the security implications. They're not really encoded. And the, the manufacturers and a lot of people were really upset that he exposed this vulnerability publicly instead of like privately soliciting a thing, you know, providing a thing that says, oh, well, this is a little bad. He's like, no, if I don't blow this wide open, there's no motivation to change, but people could still get killed by this. This is a really dangerous problem. Like thousands and thousands of people are vulnerable to this. So that's a level of whistleblowing that's like right up there. And then you've been waiting for this, right? If you are a whistleblower like Edward Snowden, like Chelsea Manning, like Alexander Litvinenko, you could become stateless, you could become imprisoned, you could die. Litvinenko was killed with polonium, which is like the most Cold War ridiculousness ever. I'm like, polonium, really? Um, but this is releasing the kind of information that changes the flow of history, that changes the story countries tell about themselves and how they relate to each other. This is like the scariest, biggest, furthest end of that graph. This is big stuff. Very few of us get called upon to whistleblow at this level. Thank God. So you have a problem in your organization. It might be your work. It might be your volunteer organization. Somewhere you have a problem. You have to decide what you're going to do about it. Well, first you have to decide why you care. And I've come up with four reasons. The first one is systems. Either you are the kind of person who believes in perfect systems and how they're going to work and how they ought to work and how harmonious something should be. And this thing that is bothering you is grit in the machine. And you want to get it out and improve the system and make everything flow better and make the gears go better and everything should click along better. Or you're the kind of person who sees systems as oppressive and you want to say, look, this system is coming in on us and we don't see it coming, but when it gets here, we'll be locked in. Kelsey Gilmore Innes' talk on Tuesday was very much about like a system that is emerging that is going to be troublesome and problematic. The second reason people whistleblow is empathy. People care about other people and they see a problem that is coming and it's going to affect somebody else. This is the Aaron Brockovich uh, whistleblowing. It's like people are being hurt by this and I can't stand to watch them be hurt. I must do something because I care about people. The third is external rules. 
um, external rules and morality govern a lot of people's actions and I think govern all of us to some extent or else we'd be paralyzed by uh, decision making all the time. So we have these rubrics for how we make decisions. It, it matters a lot which kind of rules you've chosen to adopt to make your decisions, but lots of people have rules that mandate that they say something, like, like the mandated reporter things. The fourth reason is because you want to burn it all down. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes whatever you're dealing with is so corrupt and so ugly and so horrible that the only way to deal with it is to take off and nuke it from orbit. You are invoking power not on behalf of a system or on behalf of other people. You are invoking power to destroy something. And that is also a legitimate and real reason to do whistleblowing. But you should be clear what your reasons are. So know what reason and reasons, there's never just one, you're doing this for because it changes how you present it and how you deal with yourself afterwards. Know your consequences. Like I said, the consequences over here for tattling on your sibling are small. The consequences for leaking CIA information are large. And somewhere in this spectrum is going to be you, but you have to think about where you're going to fall. This is Adria Richards. This is Adria Richards in 2012 being a developer evangelist. This is right before the internet fell on her head. Uh, for those of you who don't know, what happened was she was at a conference and a couple jerks behind her were making sexual jokes about the size of their dongles. And uh, she turned around and took a picture of them and tweeted it to the conference organizer saying, could you please talk to these guys? Like, ugh, really, again? And uh, the conference organizers talked to the guys and gave them a warning. But because Twitter is public, one of the guys also got fired. And the internet outrage machine, which you should be careful where you point this thing, kicked up and DDoS uh, her employer, SendGrid, to the point where SendGrid essentially got blackmailed into firing her because they needed to run a business and if they didn't get rid of her, this was going to keep going on. So she got fired and has been significantly harassed since 2013 and is still living with the consequences of this one tiny act of whistleblowing. And that's really scary to me. Like, I want to be the kind of person who can say, yo, you're being a jerk without it like, affecting my entire career. That's really terrifying. And I debated about putting this in because I don't want to scare people off telling the truth when it needs to be told. But I think we also need to say these things happen. On the other hand, you know what happens if you don't whistleblow? This is a diagram of the O-rings on the Challenger rocket booster. The engineers knew that those O-rings were unstable at low temperature and the temperature that launch morning was low enough for them to be problematic and to leak fuel. The engineers knew it and they told their bosses. But somewhere in the, the chain of communication that message got more and more attenuated until everybody said, okay, we're good for launch. But of course, everybody didn't actually include the engineers who knew better. Yeah. away from goodness. Um, yeah, so, so they didn't have the power to stand up and say, scrub the launch. It won't be good. We're, we're a little concerned about that. No, they, they didn't have the power to speak up and say, this is not going to be OK. The rocket might blow up. And so those engineers who were insufficiently forceful or their managers who were uh, too managery or something, whistleblowing failed and people died. So you've decided you have something to talk about. How are you going to do it? First, I want you to be prepared. I want you to clean your computer. I want you to put a box under your desk. I want you to save all your emails. I want you to believe that you could walk out of this job or this situation if you had to. Like, if you are in a romantic situation and you're like, 
I'm not okay with what is happening here, you have to be prepared to bug out. This is a Red Cross bug out bag. You have to document. So different organizations have different rules about document retention. In my experience, nobody ever gets on my case if I BCC myself on the snarky email that my boss sends me, or the email where I get asked to plagiarize. I bcc that to myself, to my personal account. But wherever and whatever kind of documentation you have, you must retain it yourself. I have a friend who worked for a nonprofit, and she had some conflict with her uh, management, and she said, I think that I might get fired. And I said, well, are you retaining all these documents for like how you're getting contradictory inst instructions and how this is complicated and how you're getting like these yelly emails at you and you're suffering a hostile work environment? She's like, no, that's all on my work account and my boss can see what I do with it. So she couldn't pull her own documentation down without alerting her boss that something weird was going on, but she could have transcribed them on paper or copied them out or taken a picture or taken a screenshot or kept a log of events, but you're gonna wanna have documentation because you wanna convince other people and also you're going to need it to convince yourself later because it is emotionally devastating to get fired for whistleblowing and you're going to believe that you were at fault. I mean, maybe you don't, but typically studies show that whistleblowers have a lot of emotional damage afterwards. And you're gonna need a team you. You need to alert the people who are gonna take care of you. I know, we needed some kittens, right? <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna need to alert the people who are gonna take care of you. You're gonna want to talk to your partner, spouse. Uh, you're gonna wanna talk to your friends. You're gonna wanna talk to a lawyer, because if it's a, at a certain level, you're going to want to make sure that you are doing things legally. You're going to want to talk to people who are on your side and invested in your interests. Your audience matters. You have to choose carefully who you tell. If you, if you leak to Julian Assange and he's a dick, then you have to deal with the fact that people sort of conflate your information with his dickishness. Um, right? <laughs> so um, who you choose to tell and, and what power you choose to invoke is going to matter to how this gets out. You want to choose somebody who has the power to do something. If you are telling a peer who doesn't have the power to invoke, you, you're not really going to accomplish anything. You want somebody who has authority, which is the external trapping of power, but sometimes it's really important to disambiguate those two things. Uh, some people have authority and not power. Some people have power and not authority. You want somebody who has both of these things. So when I told my CFO that I'd been asked to plagiarize, uh, it wasn't until he told the CEO that my boss got reprimanded because the CFO was not in the, the line of command. So you want somebody who can do that authoritatively. And you want somebody who has sympathy. They don't have to have sympathy for you. Like, very seldom are people like deeply sympathetic to people they don't know well. But they have to have sympathy for one of those four reasons that you've picked to talk. So if you want to burn it all down, you don't want to go up the HR chain, you want to go to the newspaper. And if you want to fix a system, you don't want to go to the newspaper, you might want to go up the HR chain. But whoever you pick should have sympathy for the reason you are telling or else you are unleashing something that you didn't intend. And how you tell them matters. Like, I think that especially in technology, we tend to think of typing something into a computer that will get transmitted as almost the only way to talk to someone. Um, like, oh, well, I could send them an email or a Slack or an IM or a memo. Like, Maybe you don't want to commit this to electrons. Maybe you don't want this saved anywhere. Maybe you want to write a note. Maybe you want to have a face-to-face -face conversation that is not recorded. Consider who your audience is and how that makes you more and less vulnerable. Go in with a solution. If you go in and say, I have this problem, <laughs> da -da -da, I expect you to fix it. 
um, you are a person who is complaining. And if there's a problem and a complainer, what if you just got rid of the complainer? Then there wouldn't be a problem, right? <laughs> but if you go in with a solution and you say, yo, I, I realize we just, you know, we have a deadline problem with this documentation and, and it would be easier to plagiarize, but uh, I think it would actually, like, if we slipped the deadline two weeks, I could actually write it all out. And so then you can say, look, this is a solution I have for you. Here's a plan I have for you. I've already thought about this. I am not just whining. It is all about the money. When you are trying to persuade someone, especially in a company, to do something, you have to tell them what the business case is. So the business case for not getting sued by mad attack lawyers is pretty obvious. The business case for maybe we shouldn't have a harassy dude on the team because we've lost three good employees is a little more complicated, but I think you can make it. Whatever is going on, see if you can't figure out a way that the company is going to save money in the long run. Like, I realize it's a lot cheaper to dump our toxic sludge in the Chicago River, but eventually we're going to have to play, pay that Superfund cleanup, so maybe we should you know, start fixing that now. Things like that. Um, because organizations are like humans. Their primary motivation is to survive. And so if you make this about survival for them instead of work for them, it's going to be a more appealing proposition. So when it fails, you told somebody, you said something, you made your best case, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge fell into the ocean. Find a new audience. This llama would love to hear about how we should handle personally identifiable information. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yes, please tell me about your ideas about, about user security. Uh, so find a different audience and try again, which is uh, emotionally exhausting. It's going to be hard, but you can do it. Um, this is saxifrage. William Carl Carlos Williams called it saxifrage, my flower that splits the rock. And it does, in fact, send roots down into rocks and split them apart. Um, this is the slide for endurance. Like, you've tried, you really care about the organization, you're going to stay in it and try and affect smaller change from inside. You're going to endure and split the rock. Or, you know, you could get out of Dodge. <laughs> this is usually my option. I'm like, if you can't listen to me or respect that I have made this analysis, I don't think you respect my overall thinking on systems, and I could get something else. I could be somewhere else. I could be doing work for someone else. I'm, I'm out of here. Bye. Laters. OK, so what if it works? Yes, they heard you. They stopped dumping sludge in the Chicago River. They fired the harassy dude. It's great. It's super. You won. Uh, OK, except for like there's some survivor guilt because he had like five kids. And how is he going to get another job after being fired for being a harassy dude? Or some other instance where you're like, wow, I won. And yet I feel strangely hollow, empty, and guilty because what I won was a victory to change a status quo that was benefiting me in some way. So you have to activate your team you and say, look, I'm having survivor guilt about this. I, I did a good thing, and I don't feel good about it. And you have to be aware that there's probably going to be some kind of retaliation. It is illegal. And as we all know, that means it never happens, right? <laughs> Retaliation can take a lot of forms. It may not be that you get fired. It may be that your cubicle mo gets moved away from the sunshine and into the stall by the bathroom. It's, it's a thousand subtle ways that people can tell you they're unhappy with you. This is why most whistleblowers don't remain in jobs that they have alerted someone about for very long, because they've broken that contract of trust. If you know it's coming, it's slightly better. If you assume that there's going to be some retaliation and then it will you know, be ameliorated by the good thing that you've accomplished, that's great. But you should know that there'll be some kind of backlash. So too long, I read Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> Decide what the importance of what you are whistleblowing about is 
and whether it is sufficient for you to make a statement. Identify for yourself what the likely consequences are and whether or not you can live with them. And if you can't, keep your mouth shut. Nobody is saying, unless you're a mandated reporter, nobody is saying you have to do the right thing. You might need to to live with yourself, but you need to think about that. And you should examine your motivations. This really changes how you tell people and who you tell, and it gives you an internal structure for how you think about this problem. You think about your audience, who you should tell, whether they have power and authority and sympathy, and how you should tell them. You provide them with a solution so that they can get the change made, and then you have a resolution where either it works and you are triumphant or it doesn't, and you decide how to deal with that, but there's going to be some kind of closing of the loop and, and resolution. So I don't know how comfortable I feel about this, but I'm going to say your morality matters intensely. It is really important that you understand why you are doing this and that you believe in what you are doing. If you are uncertain about being a whistleblower, talk to more people until you have decided one way or the other because at anything above like that was an inappropriate email, you are changing your life. And I think it's really for the better. I am happier working for companies that are ethical in the way that I am ethical, but I also sometimes worry about feeding my kids. So I am not going to tell anybody they are wrong for keeping silent. Uh, I am not going to take any questions publicly because we're being recorded, and I think that would be a terrible idea for a whistleblowing talk. <laughs> um, but I will turn off the microphone and you can come up and talk to me later. And uh, these are uh, my contact information. So thank you all very much.